opportunity to ask questions. We'll have a panel here uh, of some of the speakers that have been around from today uh, for today and tomorrow, and we'll try and get them to answer some of these questions. But just limiting it to the speakers wouldn't be fair. One of the rules of the fishbowl is at any given point in time, one chair needs to be empty. So between the two chairs, if both the chairs get occupied, then one of those guys will have to leave or maybe one of the speakers will have to leave. And then that allows one empty chair for anyone else from the participant to come in and sit in the chair. Why would someone come up here, right? Let's say, let's say someone asked a question about, uh, you know, what, what is your favorite concurrency model in FP? Uh, let's say that's a, that's a question and people want to talk about that. So we will have a few speakers over here who will give their opinion about what is their favorite concurrency model in FP. But maybe you feel that you have more insights or you don't necessarily agree with what was said or you have more to add, right? Then you would come up here, take the chair and share your experience or talk about your insights. And then we move around, right? So we move to the next question. So we'll take questions from the audience and then we will just kind of keep going through that. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, we will try and get it up here to answer. Uh, we could do two things, right? We could run it like a boff, which means you form smaller groups and then you just have discussions in those groups. Or we run it like a fishbowl where, you know, only the people on the stage will actually be talking. Uh, unless, I mean, obviously people can ask questions. But people over here are the people who will be actually talking. And then if you have something to add, please come to the stage and then contribute. Okay? Let's give it a shot. Let's try for 30 minutes. This has worked really well in other conferences that we have run. So I want to try giving it a shot and then we will take it from there. Right? Can I invite Bruce to come up, please? Can we have both a few gentlemen to come up? Who else is here? Ryan, why don't you come up? Go ahead, we need four people. How about Keith? We want to come up. Okay. We could have two more people from the participant to come in, join, and then you guys can feel free to circle around. So do we have anyone who has a question that they want to start with? We have one there. Who? What's the first language as a newbie programmer that you sh you would recommend them learning? That's a good question. I like Ruby. APL, obviously. I'm going to take a little longer, so I'm going to pass this on. Um, well, I was having this kind of conversation earlier with someone uh, in the hall, and I think the first language that you will, you won't pick your first language, it will be picked for you, <laughs> more likely. Um, so the question maybe is what, uh, given a language, I, I, I don't think there is one particular uh, language, there's probably a class of them. Um, JavaScript comes to mind you know, these things. But I, I really don't think there's there's an answer to that. I think there's a class of them. Um, you need to choose whether you're, I think in, in 10, 20 years, or maybe 85, like Venkat said, your first language will be a pure functional language even. But um, that's probably not gonna happen yet. So, that's me. So I, I think that there are um, a number of different characteristics in a language that um, that makes effective teaching. Um, and so so if you look at it from a perspective of, of um, what would I teach my kid using, um, then it would probably be something like a Ruby or a Python where there's not much ceremony and it's easy to, to, um, to solve problems very quickly. Um, I don't have to do, I don't have to have all of the class and module wrappings. Um, I can just basically say print four, and it will print four, right? Um, if I'm looking for, as, as somebody new to the industry, um, I'd like to look at what colleges in the United States have done um, most effectively. Um, 
And you'd have to say that MIT is one of the best colleges at teaching programming. And one of the things that they do is teach a multi-paradigm language, Lisp, to start everything off. And basically, um, they've had tremendous success in people learning Lisp and then stepping into object-oriented languages, functional languages, or even um, languages that are different from those paradigms. So um, I think that one of the things that each of us should do, um, and the reason that if I were to start a company, I'd look around this room, is um, we should each be learning new languages. And, and Foo Conference isn't really about one language. You know, if you see the, um, the banner, there's a whole bunch of them down there. Um, and that's why I wrote seven languages in seven weeks, seven more languages in seven weeks for the databases. The idea is that every new spoken language expands your mind and makes, makes you think a little bit differently. Every programming language does the same thing. It, it increases the number of idioms that you can use to attack the, um, the problems that you face every day. Uh, actually, no, uh, no, oh, you want me to go first? Uh, you know, so for me, I, I, I think, I think it doesn't matter what programming language you pick. Uh, you know, so pick something and try to get good at it first. You know, so, uh, so if, if you're, if you're in this world, then, uh, pick something that is easy to practice with. So, for example, I would pick, you know, to, to add to what you guys said, you know, Ruby or, or Python, something that has a REPL, for example, right? Allows me to uh, to quickly test my ideas out. You know, something that that doesn't require me to, uh, to to start up an IDE, for example, right? To do anything serious, right? So, so that is something I, I would I would look for, and and practice quite a bit. That, that there's no substitute to that. And then again, you know, once you're good at one, then look at something else. I'd like to add too. I would like to add too <laughs> that it seems to me it just makes sense that when you start somebody learning a language, you don't give them too much at once. You don't let you don't make them learn the, the ceremony of allocating memory and releasing memory. And so that's why it just strikes me as strange when I hear of universities starting people with. C++ or even Java. There's just so much there that's, that's really irrelevant to the heart of programming. I think, um, I mean, this may sound a little strange, but it, I think it depends to some extent also on what the end goal is. Are you trying to teach somebody to become a software engineer or to solve problems with a computer? Because if it's the latter, you might actually want to start with something like Excel. And then move over into the languages with little, uh, you know, little protocol like for, um, Ruby, Python. I would add ACL to that group as well. Even even less for the primary side. Um, so it depends on where you're trying to go. I am myself in the process of becoming an expert. Right? I mean, I'm nowhere close to it. But uh, my current strategy, and I failed in learning. In, in contributing to any functional language till now, but my current strategy is essentially take one of the classic texts, be it how to design programs, uh, CTM, SICP, whatever, right? Start with the language that it uses, right? For, because it's the least bottleneck, right? And do the book completely. Uh, the problem with a lot of us is we do the preface, learn the history of computing, go to the introduction, do the first two paragraphs, know how to write a hello world, and then jump to the next book because it got Right, I think that is the biggest problem that I face. I mean, I have done almost all the textbooks, but almost none of all the textbooks. Right, I have done done twenty percent of all the textbooks, and I ended up learning twenty percent of what what needs to be known in every single language that's out there. But that's not important. What is important is not knowing many languages, but not but knowing one language well. And the current strategy is, and I have taken SICP. I'm in the third chapter. I'm solving all the exercises as I go through. If I get stuck, I do go online and cheat. But I'm Finally, I'm working through all the examples as well, and I think that is very important. I'd also like to say that the answer to a lot of the questions that I have in my mind is technical community. And uh, when you're learning a new language, it really helps to have the support of other people. In fact, when I look back, the two functional languages that I studied, as little as I did, were Erlang and Clojure, and in both cases, 
I was in a study group, and that just helped me tremendously. I just want to add to that. Uh, pick, pick people. Don't pick languages. Um, it's going to matter not to me. If you're in a crowd where, who knows Ruby, go for it. Uh, I also wanted to add, I think we're all, we're all going to learn a bunch of languages. We're not going to just learn one language. And in some sense, maybe it doesn't matter so much. You're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna program, you're gonna learn a bunch of them. So I'm not saying don't be skillful about choosing your first one, but it's more maybe more of a social issue if the one that you're taking for it. The question. Anyone else has any other question? I'll ask Gwen, what's your favorite uh, concurrency model in SP? <laughs> uh, I guess I'll give uh, give the guys a chance to think. Um, so, um, in 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 this past year or the past two years. Um, I've started to work I actually by accident on a line of books called Seven and Seven, right? And one of the books was Seven Concurrency Models in Seven Weeks. And um, this theme is interesting to me, the Seven and Seven, because um, it's not about learning something for your job. It's about at least six of them is about learning um, things for the sake of learning. And concurrency models is one of those things that um, the concept is easy to it's easy to kind of gloss over the concept, and, and um, I'd like to comment about um, quitting when things got hard. Concurrency is likely the problem that's going to define this generation of programmers. And um, languages that solve concurrency well, and even um, different protocols within that language um, will ultimately define it. And um, there are a lot of good ones out there. There's um, you know, the, the closure approach. Um, which you know, started as um, you know, stateful transactional memory, but it's evolved to something very different. Um, and so just, just um, you know, solving problems in terms of flow, there are data flow approaches, there's the actor-based approach, there are approaches that are good um, in object-oriented language, languages, um, like the actor library that Scala uses. Um, but I would encourage you not to learn one concurrency model, but to learn several different ones and learn the diff difference between them. Um, you are some of the most elite programmers in the world, and this is what will separate you from, you from your competition, especially in the next five years or so. So, uh, in my understanding of it, I'm working my way through the concurrency model, so, uh, so I can't say I have a favorite. But I think maybe to start with a, a single process, Concurrency model, not a single process, but on a single box, so maybe in a UI, start exploring concurrency within a, a single kind of environment like a UI, like um, uh, using CSP for async and closure, uh, these kinds of things, Go language, you know, play with that um, before you go into distributed, because when you talk about concurrency, a lot of the effort is into distributing that concurrency. And that's where the real madness starts. So I think um, start small and work your way out. That's my current strategy. I don't really have an answer to this. Um, well, it's really good for me to be here. I don't know. Uh, I'm here to speak about ACL tomorrow. But one of the things about ACL is it has community features that are quite isolated. They're not really sophisticated in the sense we had before. Uh, so I don't know, perhaps, the vocabulary to answer this question correctly. What we have elected to do in ATL, and something we've just implemented, is that you can um, declare any function your function C script, which is something perhaps the C interpreter will simply block Yeah, so it's it's interesting that um, that we're starting to see con concurrency lopped on to a lot of languages that are already out there. And um, 
And in some cases, that's that's a good idea. And in some cases, because for example, in the areas of Java, um, if, if if I looked at problems five years ago, concurrency was maddening. And now with um, with the new actor-based concurrency models, it's a little bit less so. Um, but if I were to um, to give you three pieces of advice, if you're looking at this problem for the first time and with and with a fresh ability to apply a technology to a problem, the first step would be choose a language that supports concurrency and not just well, but very well. That has to be in the middle of everything you look at, right? Like a like a closure that um, that helps you eliminate mutable state and really provides the um, the careful concurrency control. With, with a firm hand to philosophy in, in the places that it does. Um, or, um, or the Erlang concurrency model, which is basically actors with, with monitors. You know, you can read the chart. It says keep calm and let it crash, right? Well, the let it crash is a philosophy that um, when things fail, um, I can have the monitoring um, protocols and the cascading failures um, arranged in such a way that it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't have an impact. So the first thing is to um, is to pick a language that does concurrency for the inside from the inside out. The second the second thing would be to make sure that you get the monitoring right. Um, the language needs to be able to support um, communication channels and error channels that are outside of the scope of the language channels. Um, and that's one of the things that the ACA based model um, and Scala, which which is actually based on Erlang. Um, and Erlang get right, um, and and the third thing is to um, is is that you have to have a framework that um, that scales um, that goes smoothly from a concurrency based model to a distribution model. Um, that's really where most of the value is going to come in when we go from one core to multi cores, and you scale that seamlessly from multi core to the cloud. Anyone else has the next question? Yes, please. Difference between these uh, these many uh, functional programming uh, languages. So, how do you know for this for this use case, this is I mean best functional programming language? So, do we have any differences depending on the use cases? For which this use case, Haskell is the best. For this uh, another use case, Scala is the best. So do we have that kind of differences? So is your question, which use cases are the best for functional programming? Is that the question? Which use case for which function, which functional programming language would you pick based on what use case? For the beginner, I mean, it would be, it would be helpful to learn, how okay, I mean, currently I'm working on this use case. I think uh, this, this functional knowledge would be the better one to solve this, my problem. Yeah, so I guess I can I, I guess um, I can I can give you a little bit of a, um, a high level view, but um, but basically the first question that you need to ask is which scenarios and which use cases are best for the functional programming paradigm, um, and I think that if you look at the problems that we're solving today, they are primarily functional problems. For example, if you look at web development. Web development is not an inherently object-oriented problem. It's an inherently functional problem. Because every HTTP request is a function call. And it doesn't get, um, and you don't really get to the form um, to way into the back end where it really makes sense to break things down into objects at all. Right? So we have been doing um, functional problems with an object-oriented language for, for a very long time. Um, no, I don't want to monopolize the mic for very much longer here. And if you're looking for high performance, Ruby is not the language to use. That kind of information that I'm looking. You know, I think practically something to consider is um, what is your ecosystem? Do you need to be on the JVM? That will already decide a lot for you. And then if you're on the JVM, are you going to use, do you want to use a particular thing that Scala is strong in. So let me just uh, clarify that. If I was going to do ACA development, I would not do it in Clojure, even though some people do attempt to do that. I would use Scala. Um, if I was going to use a thing like Storm, I would use Clojure. 
And so I think the, the, that matters. So the, the ecosystem will narrow down your search significantly. If you need to do, do high performance stuff in functional programming and you need to get close to the metal, you're going to probably uh, head for OCaml or, or, or Haskell or such things. Okay, this is an excellent question to plug in the fishbowl. I'm going to reshape the question a little bit. Okay, so audience, I'm asking you, which problems have you solved? Which particular problems have you solved that have moved your um, object-oriented language to a more functional language, or have moved one functional language to another functional language? And um, as I'm getting started, I want to see somebody out there coming up and taking one of these seats. Hopefully, two. Um, so. I am working at a company which, um, which is very small. Um, we have the Twitter model where um, we started in Ruby. Um, and we're glad we started in Ruby. We knew that we were going to have scalability problems, but we knew that the most important thing was how quickly our development team moved. Um, now we've signed on some fairly large clients. Um, so if you look at our, our homepage, you'll see um, you know, Dell, um, Nike, and uh, another couple of references that um, are very large companies, and, and so we need to move things to a new level of reliability. Um, and so um, with our next feature, we are starting some Elixir development, and we hope to move most of the stuff that we built in Ruby over to Elixir over time um, for the back end, and we'll continue to use Rails to skin the application and, um, and do um, some of the templating and the asset management. Okay, um. So I work for a company called Index. I mean, if you attended a talk earlier by Kishore, uh, we deal with a lot of data. Um, so, so we we using Scala as our primary language. Uh, so, one of the things we do we need we need to do is you know process data to multiple transformations. So, we have about hundreds of jobs that run on a regular basis. And we were using Java earlier, and we moved to uh, Scala, and we're using abstractions like Scalding that allow us to you know do this multiple uh, uh, transformations. Uh, so that's that's one piece. You know, using uh, you know, uh, for, uh, and and, uh, and and the functional paradigm actually works I mean, because it's a series of you know if you see um, transformation right you can actually uh, look at them as uh, you know uh, map filter and, and those kind of operations at the uh, at the end of the day so, so I mean that's that's one use case I would say you know functional programming uh, I mean, functional programming languages really help uh, help a lot uh, the other use case is you know we also crawl a lot of data we've got about hundred odd nodes on um, on on AWS you know where uh, we crawl close to a billion pages a month. Uh, there, you know, we use ACA, uh, that is the actor-based transparency model, that, uh, which, which is based on actor-based transparency model. Um, so, and the good thing there is that, you know, it's uh, distributed by design, which means that, you know, whatever works on your single core and multi-core, you know, also works, uh, you know, well on, uh, uh, I mean, distributed, uh, in a distributed scenario also. Uh, so, yeah, so these are the two use cases, you know, that we've, uh, we've uh, you know, encountered and we've used Scala for both. Um, okay, I think, uh, there's there's been a, some degree of talk about concurrency and how important concurrency is. Um, I still think sometimes concurrency is oversold in terms of the benefits it's offering to uh, to all of us in the short term. I don't disagree in the long term. Uh, what we've actually found is that at least my journey has been in the recent past from Java to Python and from Python to Scala. And I think the, one of the problems that it has really solved well is the problem of expression, especially computationally complex uh, code uh, can be expressed very well and using a better quality of or higher level uh, abstractions uh, as I moved from Java to Python and then I actually rewrote parts of those code from Python to Scala and at each stage there was substantial improvement, both in terms of brevity and in terms of the nature of abstractions used. Um, and I think that has helped a lot. So I, I think the whole, the benefit I have seen and real benefit I have seen is in expression. I can see that my code will do better in concurrency terms, but I haven't seen that benefit because I haven't been challenged by the concurrency parts yet. Um, so just want to share some experiences. So I've worked in Citrix like a few years ago, where we have been building a Xen server, which is a main tool stack to manage a lot of Xen uh, data machines. And so at the beginning, it was um, a very big piece of software written in C++ with uh, like maybe 20 people full time working on it. And at the end, nothing really worked correctly. So they decided to work it in, uh, into OCaml instead. And a few months later, with like 
for five people, everything was working well. The company, open source, was booked by Citrix by, with a lot of money. So everyone was happy about that. And more recently, we started to replace another big piece of uh, C uh, component, which is OpenSSL, which is a very big stuff, which is a very important piece of code. And we started to write it in the kernel, fully in, in functional code. And uh, six months later, two people, everything works, seems to work very well. So, so I guess if you are interested to high performance, okay, well, is a good, good choice. Uh, but I think that the uh, SQL is, is quite nice as well. So. For me, it is uh, it, uh, function programming helps in uh, problem domains where the solution is not clear. And the problem domain is not clearly defined. Uh, I found it very helpful, you know, in doing more, maybe you can call it explorative programming, something like that, where I define a bunch of small functions and I try to compose them in different ways and quickly try out ideas. And uh, that is how I found function programming useful. Say, for, for example, if you take uh, building a text editor, so the problem is very well defined and you have scope for a little customization. Their object oriented programming shines a lot because you can clearly defend the contract and you can uh, you know collaborate with many people with clearly defined contracts. But say, uh, uh, recently I've started working with uh, natural, na natural language processing and where uh, the solutions are not, the problem space is also not clearly understood and the solutions are also not defined. So there we have to try out lots of ideas quickly. You know. So I find the uh, function programming useful in that. I think that one of the things that starts to happen over time with any programming paradigm as we start to hit the limits, just as we hit the limits when, when um, we went from assembly language to the first structural languages, um, there wasn't, um, you know, we had to put more and more in our heads, right? And so it started to make sense to bring things up. And then um, as we moved from procedural languages to object-oriented languages, we were having problems with code organization. and. Um, as we're moving from object-oriented code to functional code, we're starting to see that um, object-oriented code doesn't always mirror the way that the world works. When it does, that, that's really nice. But um, when it doesn't, then we start, to, we start to nail down abstractions based on the frameworks that we're working with, the concurrency um, paradigms, the um, you know, natural language processing would be very much in that, um, in that you know, Sphere of understanding. Um, so I think that um, that the idea that functional programs and com composing with functions makes it easy to um, make um, designs that are more adaptable is actually a very good idea. I wouldn't call myself really a functional programmer, but you know I've played around with the concept, and where I've found it most useful is from a testability point of view. Uh, when I kind of think more from a pure functions point of view. Uh, it's a lot easier for me to from testing point of view and things like that. So uh, that's where I found an area point of view to move towards uh, functional programming and uh, to improve my testing performance in that area. So there was a point when, when um, I moved from Java to Ruby where everybody wanted to write a dependency injection container in Ruby. And we all found out that we were solving problems that Ruby just doesn't have. Well, the same thing is happening with functional um, languages. Many people want to write a stubbing or mocking, mocking framework um, for functional programs. And we're starting to understand that um, when you do that, you limit some of the benefits that, um, that, um, that you might have. So, but we have so many other design tools in our bag of tricks that, that we don't have to use the stubbing and mocking. And one of the things that's opened up in, in a highly um, concurrent language like Erlang or Elixir is that your test will run as fast as the number of cores that you can throw at it. And there's no latency between your call and, and the database at all. Um, so that was interesting to me. We have one more. We are used to get by the whole lot. A room for one more. Yeah, so. Uh, so, so we were, uh, doing one uh, integration project in which uh, basically it was a integration pipe used to run. So from different, uh, from different systems, we need, we'll get inputs and we'll be posting and uh, supplying this data in a different format to different systems. So one of the thing was that 
uh, from those different systems, uh, the kind of uh, thing we get is the XML, and we need to post into different format here. So we need to convert definitely into some uh, data. Uh, so we need to convert into typically for JSON mostly. So the challenge was that uh, the typical way we would do in Java is that you define the from the XML schema, you just create uh, say the classes, and then uh, load the uh, uh, I mean, parse the XML to classes and then from there create a JSON, and that was the very straightforward way. Uh, the challenge was that the XML structure is, was, was not well defined, or the basic elements would be defined, but the, the structure itself would change uh, drastically. And it, it was not in our control, it was created by some third party tool. Uh, so it was very hard to create, come up with the all possible kinds of classes to convert to JSON. So what we did is that we actually uh, but within those, the small elements had a logic to convert to the uh, end JSON element. So we wrote all these things as a partial function. And the moment they keep adding uh, JSONs or keep adding uh, stuff, uh, what we all we did is with those partial functions, we kept on creating multiple uh, functions which will convert any kind of XML into any kind of XML. So it was so the partial function logic was in one place, and it was very easy to maintain the code. Because we didn't have to create a lot of classes uh, which will reflect every kind of uh, XML config, XML output that we that we could get. Also, it was easy to test because it was very easy to just lift the partial function into a function and then test that uh, single piece of uh, code alone. I mean, does it make sense a little bit at least? Yeah, just one question. I mean, so I mean, I, I, mean, I just don't want to bring the dynamic topic. But don't you think that was the problem? The problem was that yeah, but we had a type system which. Uh, enforce that you 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 it yeah. presupposes knowledge of the data that you get. Yeah, fair. Uh, so I I I used to code in Ruby before, and first thing is that just let's write this piece of code in Ruby. Uh, but the point was it was a uh, the uh, rest of the everything was written in Scala. So this this one was solved in Scala. It was it was to be on JVM. So and Scala helped us. I mean, had it been Java, we would have really really struggled so much to come up with it, probably. I think that, um, so I witnessed a, a pretty interesting conversation um, at, at a conference last year between, um, I think it was Joe Armstrong or one of the other creators of Erlang, and um, one of the person that contributed to the Miranda language, which was one of the fathers of Haskell. Um, and he said um, that he did not expect to see such reliable systems to be possible in, um, in a, a, a dynamic language. Um, so anyway. I didn't mean to kill that conversation. Two standing when this is all over. Would you rather see a programming language evolve in terms of uh, abstractions, uh, data modeling, or would you rather see the execution platform evolve in terms of better implementation of the abstractions we currently have? I didn't get the question. Did some Would you rather see the uh, programming languages, like more programming languages, evolve in terms of better abstractions, better data modeling, or would you rather see the execution platform evolve in terms of better implementation of the abstractions we currently have? So I think that the question was, would I rather see um, the programming language abstractions evolve, or would I rather see the execution platforms evolve? Was that the question? That's the question, yes. Really good question. Um, you have a, you might have stumped the panel here. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what I want. Uh, I would want the language to evolve because I'm a human with this brain and it's going to have to talk in that language. And I don't. So, but of course, practically, um, the execution um, platform, of course, must also evolve. But as a human being, I have a bias. Um, but. Uh, one more thing. I mean, there are some people who are saying that um, until we've gotten rid of the virtual machines, we're not done yet. You know, so um, you know, until until a, a language has been liberated of its um, virtual machine, <laughs> we're not done. So that's another perspective. But I I, I prefer um, language. I mean, JavaScript programmers said maybe also the fact that their execution platform has basically liberated the language. From execution. So, I mean, it happens both ways. I mean, like even with uh, execution platform like JVM, we see a lot of these languages like Closer, which kind of 
think about completely new ways of thinking about uh, programming. Um, and and it, it's, I mean, I have been a Ruby programmer before, and now pretty much Closure is my go-to tool. And mostly because of the, uh, I mean, even though it's a list, it has a, enough syntactic to work as a, as a language to keep me, I, I, I make my transition easy as a Ruby programmer to a Closure programmer. Right? I mean, had it not been for those kind of things, probably, yeah, I wouldn't have picked up Closure in the first place. I, I would say it's, it's both. Uh, I don't think we can live with one and not the other. And, and the reason is, uh, I think Java is a great example. I was, I was very reluctant about Java. I said, what's the big deal? Why should I really care? And, and Java proved me wrong several times over. If, if you really look at uh, Java, it's a great example. You cannot do what's possible on the JVM without the platform, the environment really raising up to support it. But at the same time, languages are kind of the lens through which programmers exploit the platform. Without the language having the power it gives, it doesn't matter what the platform gives, we can't really reach in. And for our ecosystem to be really powerful, I think both of them have to really evolve. But there's one big challenge though, and, and this is something that I don't have a good answer for. And the challenge is, when a language has been created, and, and C-sharp is a great example of this, because over the years it's turned into a kitchen sink. It's everything you can do, and people don't have a clue how to do it right. And so there's a risk in evolving languages. And the risk in evolving languages is that the language becomes so broad that there are so many different ways to do things that there is no focus on exactly how to do things. That can be really problematic because it doesn't give a clear direction to developers. But at the same time, the reason I don't have a good answer is we don't want languages to become stagnant either. So I heard Dave Thomas say one time, which I think is brilliant but really hard to achieve, he said, for every feature that you had, you need to have the courage to go back and remove a feature. And, and that's really hard to do because we, we care about backward compatibility. The minute you touch on a feature that's already there, you're going to make a mob of programmers angry. Who wants to make a mob of programmers angry? So, so it's really a hard problem to solve. So evolution is really important, but evolution itself is an enemy to the language because then it becomes really hard to use that language in such a diversified manner. So, so it's really a hard problem to solve. There's so much goodness baked into that question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I think that one of the interesting aspects of that question is you start, if you start looking at a broad enough perspective, then um, what you're really asking is what's more important, politics or psychology, right? Or something like that, right? Where the politics, um, or maybe even economics, is, is basically um, how big groups of people um, interact with, with something, right? Um, so the, the Java virtual machine is one of the great shapers of programming languages today, right? Um, and it's actually outliving Java. But um, from a psychology standpoint, most of the interesting developments in programming languages are in two places. Um, one is with the environment and the concurrency model and stuff like that. But the other is how we actually see problems and take problems apart with our mind. In, um, so after I wrote seven languages, um, I thought that I would never write a book like this again um, because it was such a demanding process. You're, um, it takes so much of yourself to, um, to create something for one language and then go, um, go learn it well enough to not be scoffed at and laughed at and apply it to another language and still another one. But um, you know, three, four years later, I was sitting and, and thinking, wow, this is one of the golden eras of, of language development. You have Things like Elm. Who saw the Elm talk today? Did that not completely blow your mind? Um, it's it's completely revolutionary, completely radical. Um, the functional uh, or the, the functional reactive programming guys were saying, "Hey, you can't call Elm functional or reactive." And um, you know, the basically we're, we're even arguing about the what the essence of the language actually is, right? Um, which is which is kind of cool. It it um, changes the way that we think in terms of um, of what JavaScript can do, of how you can shape programs on the client side, and of really everything that the language is based on. HTML, um, the JavaScript, and all the way down. Right. There's another language in the book called Idris, which is cool to me because um, I've always thought of types as things that are separate from the expressive language itself. Right? So they're 
integers, and integers are really constraints. For a string, it's really a constraint. Well, Idris changed that way of thinking by saying, well, no, you can actually have embed the programming language into the type system itself. You think, well, how could you actually do that? Well, let's say that I want to have a type of things that are only in elements long, right? So maybe a vector is a list of six, right? So I have a vector of six integers, right? And then let's say I want to combine two vectors together. Then you can add a vector of six integers. So that type is a vector of six integers and a vector of four integers. And the result is a vector of m plus n. And that little plus in there is important because now the compiler isn't just checking um, programming syntax. It's starting to get into programming logic and intent. And that completely um, reshapes the way that you think about language. I've been mind bended by Idris, um, and I was saying to someone earlier, I thought uh, Haskell typing, when I saw it the first time, I thought, okay, well, that's sort of them. And then I saw Idris, and then I realized well, we're in the Stone Age. Um, so it looks like typing is a great grand frontier for languages. Um, and Idris is kind of the, the sci fi one at the head of it. Seems. And I'm sure Venkat is laughing his butt off up here because um, we used to have these debates about at, on these expert panels like this one about static versus dynamic. And um, everybody um, could start a debate by kind of lobbing a rock at, um, at dynamic languages. And here um, I've introduced Idris into you know, the seven more languages, which is not just static typing, but static typing with this additional constraint on it. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the pendulum is starting to swing from dynamically typed languages to statically typed languages. We won't see the results for a good long while because there's so many cool things going on in, um, in Clojure and, um, and gosh, the Elixir community, the Erlang community, but when it swings, it's gonna be a powerful one. So uh, we talked about like what happens when you look, hit the limit, and so we we went from uh, machine languages to a semi language, and then we went to imperative language because we wanted a higher abstraction from machine language, and then we wanted modularity, so we went to object oriented, and then we are hitting the limits of concurrency, so we're going to functional program. What is after that? What what is the next kind of limit that we will hit? Say, is it going to be uh, verifiability that my program should do the right thing with like dependent type languages, or will it be like search based, like with, you know we using like logic programming or constraint programming or something like that? Like, what would be the next after constraint programming? Wow. Um. So if we could answer this question, we would not be sitting up here. We would be starting a company. Um. So. We're, we're just kind of, uh, so most of us are kind of um, right on the edge of this chasm, and I'm kind of getting into the keynote tomorrow, but, um, but it's, all about, um, it's all about crossing a, a chasm, right, um, between the early adopters and then the majority. It's, um, you know, one of the things that's interesting in traveling, going places to see conferences is you get a good sense of perspective. Um, and in one sense, India is much like Japan in that there are whole rooms full of excellent, and I mean truly excellent programmers, and whole rooms full of management that's risk averse. So uh, they're very similar places, right? And so in those communities, it's it's easy to see, um, it's easy to see when the chasm is crossed because you know things change in a hurry, right? Um, but. So this kind of gets back to the you know psychology versus science, right? So we all want to be talking about psychology when we move from one language to another within the same paradigm, but then we kind of get into politics or economics, you know, on a grander scale when when everything moves at once. And um, so I would say we don't know what the business driver is going to be next time. We can start to get a couple of hints of of problems, right? So. Um, the business driver this time, I think we can all agree, is concurrency. That this is, um, right now, as things are defined and as things are practiced, object-oriented um, programming really wraps state and behavior together. 
in, I could say it in a more dangerous way, it wraps mutable state and behavior together, right? And that's going to break the current programming paradigm. This is bigger than Y2K ever was. Um, this will um, make more money for consultants than Y2K ever did. This will call, cause more damage than Y2K ever did, right? So that's this problem. The next problem, we're starting to see places where we can't hold the complexity in our heads anymore. Um, so, um, the extent that you can verify syntax with the compiler is interesting. The, the extent that you can verify logic with the compiler is much more interesting. So, I'll add a second one. Um, if, if you look at hot um, pockets of, um, of great developers, um, most of them use traditional language. Um, but there's a, there's a hot pocket of developers that use um, constraint and logic-based programming. And I think that that's one of the next paradigms that will become more and more mainstream. So one of the languages that we covered in seven languages was Prolog, and seven more languages was Mini Can Run. Um, but I think that there's a whole lot of growth to be done in the area of functional programming and even macros, which is a level above functional programming, as it's married to logic programming. Um, because really, um, as you start to get into natural language processing, um, into logistics, all of those things are logic type problems. And um, all of those things are kind of swallowed um, swallowed up by the languages and tools that we're throwing at them now. I think one of the other problems also is, sure, concurrency is exciting, but, but the real problem I see with where we have gone the wrong path is pollution of state. And I, I, I cry every day when I look at code when people go really into this command query separation and totally get it wrong and end up really creating very heavyweight objects. And, and even without problems like concurrency, it's a burden on the programmers to maintain code that turns into a lot of ceremony to build, applications that become heavy and at more effort need to be put into maintaining those applications. But, but having said that, one of the things that I see as a, a breath of fresh air is even when programming with objects, if I can turn those more into lightweight objects that where we transform state and focus on functions, it becomes easy to maintain the code. But, but having said that, I think one place where we are getting it wrong over and over is we have this desire to see that there is one way to do things. And I think we are already learning that that's not true anymore. I don't think we want to program in functional style. I think we want to program in a mixed paradigm. And I'm not defending certain languages here. There are places to improve. But if you really look at languages that are evolving, we, they are clearly beginning to provide a mixed paradigm. And so moving forward into it, I think that clearly the door is open for more mixed paradigm. Because the world definitely is not this black and white where we can say, you know, this is the way to do things here and that's the way to do things there. And I think as we embrace the logic programming, more declarative style of programming, it's really trying to shed more weight, becoming lightweight, and trying to mix paradigms in areas where it makes sense. So if, the, if you ask me what's the next thing, I think the next thing is actually unlearning quite a bit of what we have learned over the past 40, 50 years and relearning a better set of practices, I think. It's not necessarily a new tool that we need, but a better way to use the tool that, that's been around for a long time, a better uh, you know, reprogramming of our minds, I think, is, is what is desperately needed. One area where I see that I tend to write more of procedural code, uh, I have difficult for me to write, uh, to implement functional pattern in my code is when I'm working with UI toolkits or when I'm doing system programming or very recently when uh, I've been working with GPUs, where for almost every code, line of code that we write, there's other system call happening. So in such cases where uh, the state changes with almost every line of your code and there's so much of state to maintain, how do you act, uh, implement functional paradigms in whatever language you're coding? I, I think even in those areas, Rather than taking it as a state mutation, we can do a great deal by thinking about state transformation. One major inhi inhibitor in our minds is we assume that state transformation is expensive. 
and uh, we, we, we have kind of the foreground conclusion in a lot of our minds that if you really have to preserve immutability and transform state, you really are going to be inefficient. But there are data structures that are proving us wrong. There are data structures that do actually make very effective copy and transformation at a constant time. And so if we can rethink what we do, yes, sure, UI has to attain mutability because you're changing the state of the UI. But if you really look at the data that results in a transformation, right? So if you really think about how things work, a certain action happens on the UI, that gets propagated down through the system, and as a result, certain set of actions take place, and then you surface back and you display certain results back to the user. Well, sure, the UI has to change, but that doesn't mean it's got to cause enormous mutation all the way down through the layers. We can actually, if we rethink and we're willing to consider alternative designs, we can take a certain representation of data in the UI, apply a series of transformations moving forward, and what we end up getting is a transformed data that again is held by the UI and displayed, so we can actually go towards a fairly good amount of immutability in the code. But this is gonna require that we actually program systems with a very different set of mind than what we are used to right now. But, but we have been ingrained in that we start by mediating state and then passing it around. I think it requires a lot more effort on our part. I don't think there's a lack of tools. There is a lack of will, in my opinion. And, and once we are willing to move forward and consider other alternatives, I think the solutions can work out a lot better. Well, first, I, I learn so much every time I just sit down in the same room with Finca, so thanks. Um, one of the things that I think is exciting and cool that's going on in programming languages right now is this idea of reactive languages in support of things like user interface development. Um, so if you if you stop and reimagine the um, the problem that's that's um, already been you know, stated many times, you can start to see um, where the functions might be. Um, so if you look at um, you can look at a mouse as mutating state. You can also look at a mouse as a function of x and y um, with with the point of time. You can look at a movie as um, state that mutates from frame to frame, or a movie as an, infi as an infinite um, function with a time box um, over of, of a frame, which can be any type that you want it to be, um, over time. And then, um, and then mechanically, you just have to decide um, what your refresh rate is and things like that, and those are all functions as well. And when you imagine your, unif your user interface in that way, um, you know, the, the world opens up for you. I think the same thing is starting to happen in database, where we've always imagined database um, quite rightfully as a mutation because um, the limitation was, um, was in storage. Right now, we don't have a storage limitation. Um, right now, most of us, as we build our databases, are actually writing an immutable database and then saying, oh, we've got this value we're about to throw away. Let's log it somewhere. And so we build a copy. And then we and then we mutate the state. So we're going out of our way to um, from from what really would be the right thing, which is every write is in fact new data, whether it's old data or not, right? So maybe um, we're writing a function of um, of a timestamp, and then what the value is at this current timestamp, and that's the approach that data new databases like Datomic are taking. So um, so sometimes when you have a problem like user interface that looks inherently object oriented, it's just the lens that we're looking at the problem through. Another question. Uh, often uh, there are roles like programmer or tester, or we sometimes say I'm spending time programming, I'm spending time testing um, or verifying. And yet uh, the two things that you know, all of you talked about quite often was a immutability. I think to a certain extent we talked about the, you know, uh, more advanced uh, typing systems and how you know some of those benefits are playing. Given, uh, sorry, so if I was to ask the question, if I was to move from my existing set of languages to a language which has you know much better support for immutability or just supports immutability only, and has better type systems, how? How much do you think my time spent on testing will get influenced tomorrow 
and my bug counts could get influenced tomorrow? I know it's a very vague question, but that's likely the kind of question somebody who's wanting to invest money into a migration to you know functional programming likely he's going to ask that question. And you know how will my quality get impacted? And is there some kind of answer you would be able to provide there? Well, Maybe vague. So so basically the question is um, as when when you move from um, from uh, object oriented to functional from um, from mutable to immutable um, this can have a significant impact on testing um, how much of an impact um, let me interject just a just a, a small story um, I was in a session giving the keynote that I'm going to give tomorrow but I was giving it at a regular session and somebody asked me a question and I said wow that's a great question so I said what's your name and the gentleman said John Hughes <laughs> Who's, who's one of the fathers of Haskell, and you know was one of my idols, and I, I didn't get another word out the whole time. Um, but John Hughes is actually working on um, on a framework called Quick Check, which, based on the type system, based on what it, metadata based um, based on the metadata of the system, it will throw um, not just well formed values, but um, values that aren't well formed at your system, and let you know where things break. Um, so this type of thing um, is one of the reasons that I think that um, that type systems are going to um, begin to swing from um, from dynamic to static. Um, this kind of goes back into verification. There are certain classes of problems that are difficult where, where it's difficult to prove correctness, but it's not difficult to um, to throw a real world type data set at the problem and even to inject some noise. And this this type of thing. Can revolutionize um, the number of tests that you write, the the um, the way that you get coverage, and the way that your code behaves under under strain. I think there are two ways to look at it. Uh, to answer that question, we should really ask the question: Where do bugs come from? And and I can say that probably you know bugs come from two places, right? One is when the code is way too ceremonious. We tend to lose sight of what the code is really doing, and, and so errors come through that. If a code is less ceremonious, where it's more transparent, then we're able to see through it much more effectively than a code with a lot of ceremony. Uh, I mean, this is one thing we all learned, right? When you're a young programmer out of school, what do you want to do? You want to go write code. When you get experience, what do you do? You avoid writing code, right? I mean, that's what is called experience. You gain the wisdom not to write code, because hands down, the code you don't write has the fewest bugs in it. So ceremony is one area where I would say clearly it reduces bugs. The other area is when, if you really look at just as one example, right, if you look at Scala, for example, when you write a function in Scala, when you take a parameter, you don't have to say anything. By default, the parameter is final, right? It's a val. You cannot modify it. How many times have you come across Java programmers who don't declare a parameter as final? and they actually mutate input parameters. I would say quite often, right? And this is a practice you develop, the discipline you develop, and, and while we all can develop discipline, it is so nice when the language challenges you and says, try it, right? And, and these removes the burden uh, I know, from your shoulders, and as a programmer, you, that's one less thing to worry about. And as a result, your code becomes a lot more reliable, so to say, because the language makes it obvious to do the right things. So, so to me, I call these as sensible defaults. Sensible defaults are defaults that fall on the side of better programming, rather than defaults that fall on the side of, oh, you really need to go start declaring these things. So in that regard, I think that programs actually get better. But, but having said that, um, you know, our good friend Glenn Vanderberg has a saying that bad programmers will move, on, move heaven and earth to write bad code. So, so just because a language does a set of right things doesn't mean programmers automatically will do that. There's a bit of a governance that's needed, right? And, and that's why I'm a big fan of collaborative efforts. If we still believe that people will write code and nobody else will look at it, I don't think it's going to make a big difference because it's not just the code having bugs. The code being irrelevant is a problem too. How many times do we develop applications where it doesn't solve real problems, and then we end up wasting time and money developing things, right? So the collaborative nature of developing software doesn't go away. It is still important, it's still necessary, but I think these are in the right direction where it eases the pain 
But I don't think there's going to be a language that removes the pain completely from our shoulders and we say, here's a language and program and you don't have to worry about it. I, I think there's a right in the right direction, but I don't think they're going to get rid of the problems entirely. So I think, you know, when you say something like, I've got this bunch of developers and you know, what is the payoff for me to take them across to the other side? I think the cost is enormous if you talk of a whole group of people. And you know, for me, it's, I, I take a more of a guerrilla warfare approach. And I would rather say that if there's, if there's wait for a, a use case where it's either a very clear use case where you can clearly uh, state that you should be using something with more immutability, more pure functionality, and so on. And then uh, over time, take time to do it because I think it's a social cost. It's all. This is all about um, uh, our, you know, difficulty to change, the sheer risk of changing everything at once. I mean, so so I think the the for me the strategy is, you know, treat it like a garden. If you want to change the the vegetation, don't chop it all down. Just start planting differently and give it time and never have that conversation of uh, let, let's all go there. <laughs> all right, I think uh, you just kind of passed the time so we can call it a day. Uh, if you guys want to continue, we could continue for a while. There is food uh, that's ready outside. So if people are hungry, I would suggest we grab food. And we kind of continue, but not keep the formal structure in some sense, but just continue as smaller group discussions after this. Right. Thank you, guys.